Satan is doing a masterful job of stripping the identity of God from society, culture, and from the individual. Hi, I'm Don. Today we're going to jump in and we're going to talk about the LGBTQ movement and its impact in stripping God from every facet of society and what the consequences are for those of us in the body of Christ, for the church, if we embrace this sinful love. Yes, folks, love can be sinful. Let's dive in. Let's talk about how love is sinful. This podcast exists to inspire, encourage, and educate you, not just in the Word of God, but in what's happening in the culture around us and how it is radically and quickly transforming the Christian world as well. Now make sure you watch this video all the way to the end to get the full story and all of the contextual details. Love. It's such a wonderful word that's just thrown around so flippantly these days as if the word really means much of nothing. So yes, it is possible for love to become sinful. Let's jump into what that means. Let's look at a quick video of a LGBTQ plus event and let's see how this person not only exhibits love but defines it. I don't, I don't trust you anymore because you came in like a demon. Relax. 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 Don't you have any respect? Aren't you from the Love is Love community? Well, then love, love a Christian. Okay. Okay, it's okay that I'm aggravating. You have some self-control. I don't have it. Okay. Okay. This, okay, honestly, I have nothing against Christians or anything like that, okay? But all this, all this is okay? You don't need to be here right now. You don't need to be here right now. All this is Love is love, and we will love who we want to love. You can go home, because you don't need to be here. Nobody loves you here, okay? And the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, we didn't come from no Adam and Eve. We came from Lilith and Satan. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Eve, Eve was right in Satan's And that's how she became Lilith. So you guys, you guys, you guys, you need to go home, okay? Because nobody wants to hear your lies anymore. I came from a, I, I came from a Pentecostal home, and I, re I removed myself from that because what? you know what? Because the thing about it is, you guys, you guys, you guys just release hate into the world. You guys don't let people have their freedom and want to be loved. And the thing about it is, at the end of the day, there is no God, okay? There is no God. At the end of the day, there is no God, okay? At the end of the day. I, I met somebody who died, and all of the day, when you die, it's just pitch blackness. It's just darkness, okay? You are free to love who you want to love. Don't listen to the that this guy has to say. At the end of the day, they're all wrong. Well, there's a lot we could say about this video and about this person, right? But the fact is that um, that love, it, it certainly isn't exhibited here, and it's certainly uh, well confused, isn't it? You know, you are free to love whoever you want to love, but that doesn't make love love. Not in the sense that we understand love as God has given love to us or shown his love to us. And what does that mean? Well, it means that we've got to start changing the way we think about this as Christians. And there's a lot of Christians out there that have fallen into the deceitfulness of Satan's trap regarding love. Because yes, God is love, but God doesn't put... Uh, love in this context of, well, just do whatever you want or whatever makes you feel good or whatever you please. Because if you do, then it's not love. Love is not always love. Sometimes love is just pure sinful. Within the church, within the body of Christ, for those who would claim Jesus as their Lord and Savior, a God who says that he is holy and demands that we be holy because he is holy, there is no room for the love is love talk within the Christian community. There is no room for the LGBTQ plus community within the church, not because we don't love them and not because we don't want the best for them, not because we don't accept them as human beings, but because within the church, it's called to be holy for he is holy. Now let's look at a, a video. I'm gonna give you a sample of someone who would say that it is perfectly acceptable to be gay and to be a part of the church. This is not a sermon. I'm not here to tell you how to interpret your religious text. I simply ask you to explore it. 
Know your religious text for yourself. You may come to the conclusion that homosexuality is a sin. If you do, I'd like to refer you back to Religion 101. <laughs> God loves everyone. And because of that, you can now actively work to make your religious communities more open and accepting to LGBTQ people. Alternatively, you may come to the conclusion that homosexuality is not a sin. Now we know through scripture that this just isn't true. That the Bible talks very specifically about, about love and what love is. And it is always redirected back to an object of good and not evil. And why would I say that, that the LGBTQ plus movement, not people, but the movement is evil? I say it's evil because it denigrates the image of God. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them for relationship with him. The whole point of salvation is relationship with this holy and righteous God who loves his creation but has rebelled from him. And within that, that is the whole message of salvation, is, is that God recognizes that we who are not capable of coming to him, he came to us. We rebelled from him. He never rebelled from us. And so we have to put love in its proper perspective. Jesus said that, that there is no greater love than one would give up his own life for another. And that's exactly what he did for us on the cross, that, that he came from heaven, that God came from heaven fully divine and became fully man. And only God had the ability to forgive sin, to forgive the rebelliousness that was given to him, that, that this disloyalty that happened over and over again throughout the Old Testament, he provided the means. If you study the Old Testament in its totality, what you see repeated over and over again is really the, the foremost violation of the first of the Ten Commandments, which I believe causes everything else to fall behind it. And what is that one? Well, it is, you shall have no other gods before me. The very principal heart of God is, is that when he created Adam and Eve, he wanted a relationship with them. And when they rejected that relationship by eating from the tree of, of, of the knowledge of good and evil and sinned against God, they rebelled against God, that opened up an entire Pandora of problems. That box was completely opened and sin entered into the world. Now, we have different words that we see as we talked about in a previous, as I talked about in a previous podcast for, for the definitions of sin. There are many different words that, that explain it. The core principle one that keeps showing up over and over again, though, is Pesa. And Pesa is rebellion from God. It's an abdication of God. It's I'm walking away from God. I am breaking from God. And when we do that within our spirit, we turn and we begin to love things that we were never meant to love. And that in, shows up in lots of different ways. But when we look at the religions around Israel in the Old Testament, when in, in, in Moses' time, during the time of judges, during the time of the prophets, what we see is that the people continually break with God and they turn towards other religions and to other false gods. And ironically, if you happen to do a little research on the history of the Canaanites and all of the, all of the different religious people at the time of the Old Testament, all of them in some way, shape, or form involved sexuality. Why? Because we have a strong sexual drive. And that strong sexual drive can be manipulated and distorted. And what greater and easier way for Satan to infiltrate God's people than to get them through our sexuality. And so what we saw was when you look at these, uh, these false gods, the Canaanite gods again, et cetera, et cetera, you see these little statues and these little statues all in some way, shape or form reveal a sexual nature. We see this in the New Testament, the God of Aphrodite, right? The goddess of love. They had prostitution temples and you saw this at the, at, at I believe it's in Ephesus. No. Was it Ephesus? Might be Ephesus. I'd have to go back and look at this. But 
Yes, it's Ephesus. Absolutely it is. So with that said, uh, there, are, there was a, a temple to Aphrodite there, and it was a prostitution temple. You went and paid money, and then you had sex with the prostitutes as a form of worship to the god of Aphrodite. It was to express your love to her, right? Today, we see within the LGBT community that this kind of love that, that, that is being permeated, we should have the freedom to love whoever we want to love. You are free to love who you want to love. It is a distortion of God's image and a distortion of what God love meant, of what God meant love to be. And here we see in, in Romans 2 that they once again turn to other gods in their hearts. They worship other things other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they do this, Paul tells them that they have been made known about God and that he is evident throughout his creation and that they are without excuse. But I want you to notice what it goes on to say in the next part of the passage. Therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Love is sinful when we remove the object of the proper place that that love belongs and puts it in an improper place. Our first love and devotion should always be to God. And then secondly, within the inherent natural part of creation, God gave man woman, right? And woman gave him, gave her man. And in that marriage relationship is the love which resembles the love that Jesus has for his church. When we dishonor that and we break that down and we turn love into something inherently selfish, what we get is an evil response. Okay, so when we have rebelled from God this strongly, is it any wonder that we would have people that are hurting so badly and so distorted about what love is that they would go and create a, a alternative perspective on love? So when John says, don't love the world, John says, don't love that system that takes you from God, that takes the object of who is love and who demonstrates love and whom we should have love for. Don't distort it. Don't take that away by empowering it, enabling it, and participating in it. Within the church, we must understand that if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There is no way, as we, can, as we see in Romans, there is no way to say that love involves or includes homosexuality, transgenderism, the queer movement, all of this stuff, right? It's not from God. It's from Satan. It's from the world system that seeks, again, I can't state this any clearer, it specifically seeks to, seeks to eliminate the image of God embedded in each and every one of us. And in itself, that is what is the abomination. Now, in a previous study, I'm going to pull out a sheet right here. We had talked about these seven different words for sin, and one of them is abomination, right? Uh, it's to'eba. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, not being a Hebrew speaker. But the point is, is that this word means to be repulsive or to abhor, i.e. abomination. It is repulsive to God to destroy or to seek to eliminate his image. This is the battle, brothers and sisters, that we're up against. Whatever the world is going to do, the world is going to do in its deception and its, its desire to please its God, who is Satan. 
But within the church, we are called to be holy, for he is holy. And what is holiness? Holiness is the attribute of God that says to be without sin. Holiness is to be without sin. Righteousness is the behavior that comes from holiness. It is the acts of holiness. It is the act of being without sin in our behavior, our thoughts, our deeds, our feelings, etc. Now, when we go back and we look at how people are interacting on these subjects, do we see love? Is this really love? Because if anyone loves the world, then they do not love the Father, and the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we going to tolerate this type of sin within the body of Christ? Because the question we have to ask ourselves is, is it within the body of Christ? How do we love these people into helping them understand the truth? And, and folks, love. Love does not tolerate or accept all things. That is impossible. That isn't love. What love is, is sometimes standing up for the truth and saying, we cannot accept this. Love does not tolerate evil. Love seeks to correct it, and when not corrected, rebukes it. Evil has no place in the body of Christ. And folks, God is not going to tolerate, not for one moment, He's not going to tolerate us messing with his image, with his character of holiness or his attribute of righteousness. He is not going to allow that. And so, brothers and sisters, if you're in a church that's teaching that we should love for the sake of love because God is love, yes, God is love, but God is love, not in the context that they're teaching. God is love in that he seeks that all should come to know him. And then all should walk in holiness and righteousness. Not because we are holy and righteous, but because Christ imputed his love upon us by what he did on the cross. And that we seek love in a sense that we want to obey him and follow him and to be his ambassador on this earth. That is love. Love is calling things out. When, for, for actions and behaviors that run contrary to Scripture, that run contrary to the nature and the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that run contrary to the love that the Father has for us. I mean, think about it. What parent, what good parent who loves their child doesn't, doesn't mourn for them when they're walking away from the truth that they have been taught, Right? I want to come back to the very point of that very first commandment that God gave. You shall have no other gods before me. Israel rejected that over and over and over again. I mean, M Moses is on Mount Sinai, and no quicker is he pinning or writing or inscripting into stone these words when he comes down from the mountain and he finds that they have built a golden calf and are worshiping the false gods around them. Over and over, their idolatrous behavior is what got them into trouble. And that idolatry led them into sexual sins. Over and over again, as I spoke about earlier. And today, the sexual sin, the idolatry, is that love is love. It is the philosophy, the idolatry of love, that has led so many astray. We live in a culture that needs to hear that love is sinful sometimes. We live in a culture that says that love is not love when it runs contrary and in contradiction to truth. Why are people so angry when they're called out for sin? Because they know in their heart that that's true. Satan lashes out whenever he's rebuked. And the children of this world, who are not the children of the Father, they are the children of Satan. Would we not expect them to behave, you know, to behave in the same way? Of course we would. So let's just go back and remember, in these two videos that we saw, God did not create you to be anything other than his child. And to abdicate that, to walk away from that, and to embrace anything other than that is sin.
So you might be saying to yourself that maybe I'm in the LGBTQ lifestyle and does this mean that there is no hope for me? Does it mean that that my love that I have for someone else is sinful? Uh, I want you to know there's hope. I want you to know that you aren't alone. I'm going to share another short video with you of this young woman who was once in a position that you might find yourself in. And I want you to just listen to her story. I was in the LGBT community for 16 years. I was planning to have breast removal surgery. Next to me and gives me a vision. There was a man and a woman on one side. And then on the other side, there was a man and a man and a woman and a woman. The man and the woman had babies. It was like glowing really bright. And it was like generations went down the line. And then on the other side, with the man and the man and the woman and the woman, there was a red line under their feet. And it was black because you, you can't recreate life that way. God speaks to me and he says, I made man and woman so you could recreate and share the good news of my son, Jesus Christ. But the devil is wiping out entire family bloodlines and generations of people that I intended to be born will not exist for my glory. Wow, I've been really selfish my whole life. Everything in my life was based on my feelings. The next day, I went to church and I got set free of the demonic spirit of Jezebel. And I didn't know anything about demons. I didn't know there was a spirit behind homosexuality and demons behind false identities. The devil stole my identity from a very young age. And that's why I believed I was born that way. God loved me the entire time. Brothers and sister, you are not without hope. So today, today could be the opportunity for you to learn what real love is, to discover the kind of love that is so transformative that it changes everything about you. It changes you from the inside out in ways that you can't imagine, in ways that release you and give you peace and comfort, a hope and a future. So I hope you'll join the millions of other Americans out there that are in this journey as they seek God they seek his love and his kingdom, and they set aside and deny their own desires, and they pick up Jesus' cross, and they follow him with devotion and love and affirmation.